but also <laughs> what your agenda is. So, um, and Mr. Chairman, one of the things that carriers need uh, is certainty to invest, and I think you gave us some clear indications of certainty of where you're going. And this is the group that will invest in rural America. So thank you, one and all. Next, let's uh, move on to our next speaker, Commissioner Clyburn. Um, and she'll be able to share some more with you about uh, what's happening at FCC and, and on the M Health arena. It's a pleasure to have her back with us. As you know, she's a longtime friend and champion of small competitive wireless carriers. And she's highly, a highly valued ally at the FCC. I think it's safe to say that I know of no one more interested than Commissioner Clyburn in ensuring that rural America has access to high-speed broadband. And I assure you, there is no one better informed as to the challenges faced in that endeavor. So she's also a great communicator and a great speaker, so I am doubly pleased to introduce you. Please give it up for our next speaker, Ms. Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. Oh my goodness, no pressure there, huh? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I wish to once again um, uh, thank you, Steve, for such a gracious introduction. Uh, you continue to honor me with your invitations to address uh, your distinguished uh, members, and it is always a pleasure for me to join CCA at uh, any gathering, but particularly your annual conference. This mobile device, touches on nearly every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives. It is not only a means of voice communications, but a source of news and information. It is a running buddy, maybe not for me these days, don't tell my mom, a mobile wallet, a virtual teacher, and even a lifeline. And it is important uh, that we address these things. It is important that we come up with new and innovative ways that it can help improve our lives, increase efficiency, and promote opportunities. But without a broadband connection, with the exception of a, an occasional text or an occasional real rare voice call from our teenagers, this is just a paperweight. Now for those of you who have followed me for any length of time, you know I am steadfastly committed to promoting policies aimed at ensuring all Americans, no matter where they live, have access to robust and affordable fixed and mobile broadband services. So with the moments I have with you this afternoon, I wish to talk about the ongoing work at the FCC when it comes to that goal, as well as the Connect to Health initiative, which examines the intersection of broadband connectivity, advanced technology, and health. The Commission's Universal Service Program serves as an important enabler of opportunities for many in our communities that would otherwise be left in the digital darkness. My overarching principle when it comes to universal service is delivering the most bang for our buck. How can we get the best broadband to the people who need it the most while maximizing limited universal service dollars. We should always ask ourselves that. Now I think about the mobility fund. This is something I deeply care about. I think about this in the exact same way. Consumers in rural areas, urban areas, and everywhere in between must have access to robust mobile voice and data services. Consumers expect an always on, everywhere available connection, and they have for some time now. Reasonable and comparable service across this nation is and should always be our goal, but while we have been working on this on the fixed side of the ledger for a long time, let's face it, reasonably comparable mobile service, let's admit to ourselves, this is somewhat new. Phase two of the mobility fund is an issue that has languished at the FCC for far too long, and I am so pleased like you. I heard the applause behind stage. Uh, to hear that the chairman has affirmed to all of us that he will move forward and expeditiously on this. And that deserves a round of applause, not for me, but for the chairman for doing that. <laughs> but you know, like I do, that it took us almost a decade to get where we are today. 
My state colleagues on the Federal State Joint Board on Universal Service back in 2007 wisely called on the agency to adopt a universal service support mechanism to bring mobile service to unserved areas. The FCC heard that call. And in 2010, and there it goes, there is our sign out there that we need service. We voted to kick off a proceeding to bring mobile voice service to areas that at that time did not even have 3G service. We brought the first part of that proceeding home in our landmark reforms of the Universal Service High Cost Program in 2011. That action made a one-time $300 million investment to immediately accelerate deployment of mobile service in unserved areas and a separate one-time $50 million of support targeted to tribal areas. Now, I saw the fruits of the latter during my Connecting Communities tour in a town called Torian, New Mexico in the Navajo Nation. This is a place that would not have received mobile service without that tribal mobility fund. Our 2011 reform order expected to, and I quote, adopt the distribution mechanism for phase two of the mobility fund in 2014 with implementation in 2013. At the same time, the commission began a five-year phase down of existing wireless support. Now, you may have been too busy to notice, but it's 2016. And we don't have a phase two, but we will soon. And this is precisely why, back in 2014, I supported pausing the phase down of existing support because loss of support with no permanent fund in sight made no sense then, and it makes no sense now. Now, I want to have a decent reception when I walk back in the halls of the FCC when I get back next week, so let me go on record as saying that I understand why it has taken so long. There are certainly challenges in evaluating coverage and service quality as we attempt to craft phase two of the mobility fund. Some of this has to do with the very nature of mobile service. Mobility is a wonderful feature to be sure, but it raises additional difficulties in evaluating whether consumers are getting what they are promised in mobility fund phase two. Signal strength may vary throughout a cell sector, but may be weaker at the edge of a cell site. Even when a consumer can connect to a cell site, connection strength may limit the ability to maintain a voice call or have a robust data transfer. Sites may be impacted by users entering and exiting a cell site, and data speeds may not be constant throughout the entire sector, particularly if a consumer is in motion. Because of this, Getting good data on deployment can be and is difficult. The FCC collects self-reported mobile deployment data through our Form 477 process, but it seems like not a month goes by without someone complaining about how inaccurate Form 477 data is impacting them in one way or another. But CCA, this is the best method we have right now. Now, I know some have come up with additional ideas like drive testing, which can provide hard data about coverage on roads. It is tied to a road system while the usage of the network clearly goes beyond the roads, particularly in rural areas. But even drive testing can be susceptible to meteorological uh, conditions and that the number of users in a cell and how fast that driver is moving. With all of that said, I want to base our decisions on the best data available, and I remain open to hearing ideas about how we can improve on that data that we are currently using. And speaking of data, I would be remiss if I neglected to mention how the Commission's work on business data services could help with your operating expenditures. Backhaul is a significant part of wireless providers' bottom line, and I have heard numbers as high as 30% of operating expenditures being devoted uh, to backhaul by mobile providers. In too many areas, the incumbent LEC is the only provider offering backhaul, and this can mean gross market power, inflated prices, and bad deal terms. We are working to fix that. 
The chairman has proposed reforms by the end of the year, so stay tuned. Another important issue I remain fixated on is a lifeline program. Now, I know you have heard stories time and time again from those in your communities who share with you what it means to have voice or broadband services and why they are so incredibly grateful for the connections provided by you. But there are others in your communities who do not have service, not because you have failed to deploy it, but be because they cannot afford it. So when we were considering our lifeline modernization order earlier this year, I heard the concerns from small providers when it came to the ETC process and fought like heck, be it on record that I said heck, to streamline that process to make it less burdensome for providers like you to participate in the Lifeline program. So I am hopeful that this and other reforms address the bulk of the concerns you may have had previously with the program and that your company will soon participate in Lifeline. We continue to see the benefits that connecting communities bring in the form of enhanced economic development, civic engagement, and improvement by way of access to vital services like healthcare and education. Your participation here would help many for whom a broadband dream has been a dream deferred. This is a good segue on the final topic, the FCC's newest task force. The commission is on the cutting edge when it comes to examining the intersection of broadband connectivity, advanced technology, and health. Launched in 2014, the Connect to Health Task Force has been busily studying how broadband, the power of broadband, can be used to accelerate the adoption of healthcare technologies. As wireless providers, many of you serve rural communities and you know the significance of broadband-enabled healthcare. That connectivity you provide is more than just a gateway, however, to devices, services, or applications. It is about that individual, that consumer, that patient. It is about how technology can meet the needs and improve the lives of people in all communities. It is about how universal access to healthcare, access to the same care and well-being as that most rich or well-heeled neighbor, strengthen the bonds within our local communities. I saw this firsthand during a visit earlier this year at the University of Mississippi Medical Center for Telehealth in Jackson, Mississippi. Yes, I'm from the South, so I say Mississippi. And this is a shining, is it Mississippi in the house? Mississippi. This is a shining example of how bringing broadband connectivity to an economically challenged, underserved area can make a real difference in improving health outcomes and lowering costs. Then in May, I traveled to Houston, Texas. I can't do that Texas accent, I'm still working on that. For a conference on how broadband can help tackle our nation's challenges around mental health. According to the Centers for Disease Control, Mental health is incredibly pervasive in this nation. Last year, one in five Americans, over 40 million people, had some form of mental illness. This is more than the population of Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, and Louisiana combined. And what I learned here is that connectivity can be more than just a passive vehicle. It can offer support and care when and where that individual needs it. It can personalize clinical approaches. It can be a force multiplier addressing serious mental health professional shortages in this nation, particularly those shortages in rural and underserved areas. Also in Houston, I had the opportunity to see firsthand a demonstration of how wireless technology is improving overall patient care. Project N Ethan, which is an initiative in the Houston Fire Department, is connecting the city's first responders to call centers staffed by physicians. Thanks to the power of mobile broadband and a tablet, those EMTs that are dispatched to a 911 call can connect their patient with one of these physicians through a video chat 
And in just over 80% of those cases, they have eliminated the need for a costly hospital visit. Now, most recently, our Connect to Health Task Force launched a new broadband health mapping tool, which allows federal, state, and local agencies, as well as the private sector, to examine the relationship between connectivity and health at the local level, as well as to identify current issues and develop future solutions to address connectivity gaps and promote positive health, health outcomes. Now, what we have learned from this initiative is that rural counties are 10 times as likely as urban areas to have low broadband access and high diabetes rates. Similarly, the neediest counties when it comes to the intersection of broadband and health are concentrated in the South and Midwest. Knowing all of this will help all of us, particularly the public and private sectors, target those limited resources to improve infrastructure and deploy connected health technologies. Now, I want to be invited back here, so let me at this juncture thank all of you for your attention this afternoon. Now, I have said this before and I will repeat it today. My door remains open to each and every one of you. As someone who was a general manager of an extremely small local newspaper for 15 years, I understand that running a small business can be difficult. Each of you performs a function that is integral, and many of you provide services that may not be offered by any other person in your markets. You often do this without the scale that makes it easier for those much larger players, those providers, it wouldn't surprise you, are the ones that come into my office the most. But worry not. I know the invaluable roles that you play. And I am vigilant and mindful of the impact regulations may have on businesses of your size. This is why I continue to listen to your concerns, because your advocacy is important and will never, ever be ignored by me. Your voices continue to make a difference in how I view the world. Now next month on October 19th, I will host what we call a Solutions 2020 Policy Forum in Washington, DC, to explore solutions to bring in affordable and competitive services to consumers and small businesses. The, former, the, the forum is a culmination of my Connecting Communities Tour, which I embarked on about six months ago. Now, I hope to see you all there in some form or fashion. Connectivity will make that easier so you have no excuse. But this will be the start for me, or a restart, a rebooting of a dialogue on how best we can collectively meet the growing and diverse needs of our communities. So I look to hear from you then, and I am here for you now. So once again, I wish you a great conference. And once again, I encourage you to stay tuned. The best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. We 